Thanks, Deborah. Uh, thanks, Michael and Rabbi Stein, and to uh, congregation members of the congregations. Uh, let me just give a little caveat. Uh, normally, as a uh, uh, black preacher, uh, I would uh, give this presentation extemporaneously, uh, which uh, may take up until an hour. <laughs> You know, uh, black preachers have a tendency to be long-winded, if you will. So, uh, for the most part, I'm going to do this presentation uh, uh, from uh, manuscript. So, I hope, hopefully, um, it would be clear to you and concise and, and helpful. So, um, uh, talking about uh, uh, mass incarceration and uh, in particular, the criminalization and racialization of people of color. Uh, in 1982, and arguably uh, as early as 1970, the era of mass incarceration began. Um, this growth in the nation's prison population was a deliberate policy. It was inflamed by campaign rhetoric that focused on an uptick in crime and orchestrated by people in power including legislators who demanded stricter sentencing laws, state and local executives who ordered law enforcement officers to be tougher on crime, and prison administrators who were forced to house growing population, a growing population with limited uh, resources. And although the unprecedented increase in prison populations during this period may seem like an aberration, the ground was fertile for this growth long before 1970, 1980. Mass incarceration is an era marked by significant encroachment on the freedom of racial and ethnic minorities, most notably uh, Black Americans or African Americans. But this inequitable treatment has its roots in the correctional eras that came before it. Each one, and this is important to note, each one building on the last and leading to the prison landscape we face today. So this presentation attempts to tie together this country's history of racism with its history of incarceration and recounts several important junctures in the history and the rise of the prison industrial complex or mass incarceration in the United States. So let's quickly look at the first era. Of course, we must talk about American slavery uh, as uh, benefit and social control. American slavery endured for 240 years, as most of you know. Uh, but slavery was a mechanism and a tool for social control to bring economic benefit to mostly white Southerners. Slavery was not only legal in the South, but slave codes were enacted to ensure that slaves would remain the property of slave owners. These codes included forbidding slaves to learn how to read or write, to travel without permission or papers, and then they were limited in where they can travel, uh, even limited to travel to another plantation. Uh, they were forbidden to co-mingle with whites and even uh, to marry. In other words, a slave was to be forever a slave. And if he or she ran away, uh, attempted to run away, rebelled or engaged in seditious acts, like an insurrection, various forms of punishment were administered, including the disembodiment of limbs, physical beatings, and even death. Slaves then were simply chattel property with no rights by which any white person had to honor or respect. So for 240 years, uh, this was the case mainly in uh, the South. So after slavery comes emancipation uh, emancipation did not immediately occur with uh, the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. Emancipation really came at the end of the Civil War. Uh, in fact, uh, when the proclamation was made in 1863, uh, it was not two years later until uh, the last uh, group of slaves were set free in Texas uh, in 1865 on June 18th, June 19th. That's why African Americans celebrate uh, June uh, 19th. But anyway, it, uh, um, it came, uh, emancipation, uh, what followed, uh, slavery was emancipation and then a period called reconstruction. Uh, and emancipation and reconstruction is typically recognized as the period 
extending from 1863 when the North freed the slaves uh, to 1877 uh, when it abandoned them and then withdrew federal troops. During this period, African-Americans experienced uh, concrete gains politically and socially within a short matter of time, for example, uh, by 1868, uh, 1868 or 1870, there were at least 15 blacks elected to Congress and blacks were free to travel and socialize uh, with whites. However, uh, black progress was short lived. Emancipation as W.E.B. Du Bois states was only a brief moment in the sun. When the federal troops withdrew from the South white supremacists who wished to return to recent days of white control and dominance quickly reasserted their ideological stance by enacting black codes. All across the South then, black codes were passed that had outlawed behaviors common to black people, such as walking without a purpose, or walking at night, hunting on Sundays, or setting, uh, or settling on uh, public or private land, or for not working, which we call vagrancy laws. Vagrancy was deemed a crime. So while it marked the end of the Civil War and the passage of the 13th Amendment, it also triggered the nation's first prison boom when the number of Black Americans arrested and incarcerated surged. This was a result of state governments reacting to two powerful social forces. First, public anxiety and fear about crime stemming from new leaf uh, freed Black Americans, and second, economic depression resulting from the war and the loss of free supply of labor. State and local leaders in the South used the criminal justice system to both pacify the public sphere and bolster the depressed economy. These laws also stripped formerly incarcerated people of their citizenship rights long after their sentences were completed. Among the most well-known examples of laws that temporarily, temporarily or permanently suspended the right to vote of people uh, convicted of felonies. Southern law enforcement authorities targeted black people and aggressively enforced these laws and funneled greater numbers of them into the state punishment system. So that by so then by uh, 1870s, almost all of the people under criminal custody of the Southern states, a full 95% were black. State penal authorities deployed these imprisoned people to help rebuild the South. They rented out convicted people uh, to private companies for a system of convict leasing and put incarcerated individuals to work on, for example, prison farms to produce agricultural products. In the Reconstruction South, these were physically attractive strategies given the destruction of Southern prisons during the Civil War and the economic depression that followed. Convict leasing programs that operated through an external supervision model in which incarcerated people was supervised entirely by a private company that was paying the state for their labor, turned a state cost into a much needed profit and enabled states to take penal custody of people without the need to build prisons in which to house them. And although economic, political and industrial changes in the United States contributed to the end of private convict leasing in practice, by 1928, other forms of slavery like labor practices emerged. State prison authorities introduced the chain gang, a brutal form of forced labor in which incarcerated people toiled on public works, such as building roads or clearing land. Chain gangs existed until the 1940s. And as with convict leasing before, those sentenced to serve on chain gangs were predominantly black. Prison farms also continued to dominate the Southern landscape during this period. In 1928, Texas was operating 12 state prison farms and nearly 100% of the workers on them were black. The loophole contained within the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery and indentured servitude except as a punishment for a crime, paved the way for Southern states to use convict leasing. Prison farms and chain gangs as a legal means to continue white control over black people and to secure their labor at no or little cost. Very few white men and women were ever sent to work under these arrangements. So by assigning black people to work in the fields and on government works, 
the state sanctioned punishment of black people was visible to the public, while white punishment was obscured behind prison walls. By many accounts, conditions under the convict, le convict leasing system was harsher than they had been under slavery. As these private companies no longer had an ownership interest in the longevity of their laborers, who could easily be replaced at low cost by the state. And although the incarcerated people subjected to this treatment uh, sought redress from the courts, they found little relief. Time and time again, the courts approved of this abusive use of convict labor, confirming the Virginia Supreme Court's declaration in 1871 that an incarcerated person was, in effect, a slave of the state. Now, that all took place in the South, but uh, let's look just for a few uh, moments at prison in the North. And I like to uh, uh, draw this parallel, if you will, uh, when people, particularly African Americans, uh, migrated to the North, migration took place uh, early 1900s and then uh, 1950s. But uh, when uh, African Americans migrated uh, to the North to escape, uh, Southern hostility and racism, uh, they came, uh, they realized uh, after getting to the North, they just had really migrated up South. <laughs> so uh, though the North was supposedly free, uh, it was still not uh, a welcoming place for most African-Americans. So let's look at the prisons in the North from 1920 to 1960. At the dawn of the 20th century, in a rapidly industrializing, urbanizing, demographically shifting America, blackness was refashioned through crime statistics. Northern black crime statistics and migration trends in the 1890s, 1900s, and 1910s were woven together into a cautionary tale about the exceptional threat black people posed to modern society. In Chicago, uh, in Philadelphia and in New York City, this tale was told, infused with symbolic references to American civilization, to American modernity, and to the fictive promised land of unending opportunity for all who, regardless of race or class or nationality, sought their fortunes. The first half of the 20th century saw an expansion of prison populations in the Northern states, which coincided with the shifting ideas about race and ethnicity an influx of black Americans to urban regions in the North and increased competition over limited jobs in Northern cities between newly arrived black Americans and European immigrants. As a backdrop to these changing demographics, public anxiety about crime flourished. A brief spike in violent crime in the 1920s was met with uh, incendiary media coverage. Highly publicized federal interventions into local crime and the branding of certain suspected criminals as public enemies, stoking pu public fear and supporting criminal stereotypes. The growing fear of crime often directed at black Americans, intensified policing practices across the country and inspired the passage of a spate of mandatory sentencing policies, both of which contributed to a surge in incarceration. So between 1926 and 1940, state prison population across the country increased by 67 percent. Between 1910 and 1970, over six million Black Americans, African Americans migrated from the South to the Northern urban centers. Known as the Great Migration, this movement of people dramatically transformed the makeup of both the South and the North. So that in 1910, 90 percent of Black Americans lived in South, but by 1970, that number had dropped to 53 percent. These migrants, typically more financially stable Black Americans, were fleeing racial terror and economic exclusion. This influx of people overlapped with the waves of immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe who continued to disembark and settle across the country throughout the first half of the 20th century. During this period, the dominant white class connected criminality to three distinct groups, lower class whites, immigrants, and Black Americans. However, while white and immigrant criminality was believed by social reformers to arise from social conditions that could be ameliorated through civic institutions such as schools and prisons, black criminality was given a different explanation. Widely popular, but since discredited the theories of racial inferiority that were supported by newly developed scientific categorization 
schemes took hold, combined with the popular portrayal of black men as menacing criminals, as represented in the film, The Birth of a Nation, released in 1952. A sharper distinction between white and black Americans emerged, which also contributed to a compression of European ethnic identities, for instance, Irish, Italian, and Polish, into a larger white or Caucasian ethnic category. These beliefs also impacted the conditions that black and white people experience once behind bars. As in the South, putting incarcerated people to work was a central focus for most Northern prison systems. Until the 1930s, the industrial prison, a system in which incarcerated people were forced to work for private or state industry or public works, was the prevalent prison model. Gratuitous toil and pain and hardship became a primary aspect of punishment while administrators grew increasingly concerned about profits. The rise of organized labor in the 1920s and 1930s, as well as the passage of federal legislation restricting the interstate commerce of goods made by convict labor brought an end to many industrial style prisons. In their place, the conditions and activities that made up the incarceration experience remained similar, but with purposeless and economically valueless activities like rock breaking, replacing factory labor. By the mid 1900s, the white immigrant groups, white immigrant groups were absorbed into the white racial category. The white public became increasingly concerned about the conditions they endured in prison. So starting in about 1940, a new era of prison reform emerged. Some of the rigidity of earlier prison structures was relaxed and some aspects of incarceration became more physically and psychologically tolerable. Under this new correctional institution model, prisons were still meant to inflict a measure of pain on those inside their walls, but the degree was marginally reduced in comparison to earlier periods. These prisons offered more recreation, visitation, and communication with the outside world, the regular access to the mail, as well as sporadic movies or cons concerts. Most notably, this period saw the first introduction of therapeutic programming and educational and vocational training in prison settings. So, um, incarcerated African Americans and other racial and ethnic minorities uh, also lived in race segregated housing units and their exclusion from prison social life could be glimpsed only in their invisibility. Their experiences were largely unexamined and many early sociological studies of prisons do not include incarcerated people of color at all. The conveniences I mentioned before were basically uh, enjoyed uh, by whites. Now quickly, the civil rights era, um, era of black progress and what I call white backlash uh, via tough on crime. Uh, beginning in the 60s, law and order rhetoric uh, with racial undertones emerged in politics, which ultimately ushered in the era of mass incarceration and flipped the racial composition of prison in the United States from majority white at mid-century to majority black by the 1990s. As in previous periods, the criminal justice system was used to marginalize and penalize people of color. In the 1960s and 1970s, as riots broke out in a number of urban centers and a wave of violent crime rolled across the United States, politicians on both sides of the aisle uh, not only continued to link race and crime and rhetoric, they took action in acting harsh and punitive punitive oriented policies as solutions to rising crime rates. So uh, subsequent presidents, even the president uh, candidate at that time in 1963, 64, Barry Goldwater campaigned on a platform that explicitly counted, uh, connected street crime with civil rights activism. Uh, this was the language they used again to, uh, for social control and to uh, arrest uh, people of color, particularly uh, African-Americans. The civil rights movement itself uh, was uh, actually a, a crime or people engaged in the criminal uh, activity. Sounds familiar today. Uh, even in 1964, President Lyndon Johnson declared, before he declared the war on poverty, that is, he declared the war on crime and name crime that was perceived to be occurring mainly in urban centers, uh, followed by Richard Nixon, who successfully used a street crime uh, and civil rights activism narrative in his 1968 and 1962 
presidential campaigns. Then compounding the persistent myth of black criminality was a national recession in the 1970s that led to a loss of jobs for low skilled men in urban centers hitting black men the hardest. Many black Americans found themselves trapped in a decaying urban core uh, with few municipal services or legitimate opportunities for employment. The quality of life in cities declined uh, under these conditions of social disorganization and disinvestment and drugs and other illicit uh, markets took hold. Fast forward to the war on drugs and the emergence of what I call the new Jim Crow or what uh, Michelle Alexander has called uh, aptly called the new Jim Crow mass incarceration. In the 1980s and 1990s, policymakers continued to turn punitive policing and sentencing strategies to restore social order and address increasing drug use, resulting in larger and larger numbers of unemployed Black urban residents with low levels of education being swept into prison. The numbers are stunning. This is from 1980s. The numbers are stunning. In 1970, for instance, the state and federal prison population was 196,441. By 1985, it had grown to 481,616. And by the year 2000, federal and state correctional authorities had jurisdiction over 1.6 million people. These numbers have defined the current period of mass incarceration. And this growth in incarceration disproportionately impact Black Americans, African Americans. In 2008, Black men were in prison at a rate six and a half times higher than white men. By 2010, the prison population had reached 2.5 million, 2 million, 2.5 million. The incarceration boom fundamentally altered the transition to adulthood for several generations of African American men and to a lesser but still significant extent, Black women and Latino men and women. By the turn of the 21st century, Black men born in the 1960s were more likely to have gone to prison than they have completed college or military service. Even today, criminologists and sociologists suggest that because of mass incarceration, and if that is not brought under control, uh, if you see three Black boys in a room, three Black boys in a room, one out of three of them by the time he reaches his 19th birthday, will have encountered law enforcement. And by the time he reaches 25, he will have been in jail or prison. So it was a war on drugs that led to uh, the increase of uh, large numbers of people being uh, put into prison. So to sum up, mass incarceration simply understood is racialized social control and its impact upon communities of color are devastating. Impacts include disenfranchisement, excluded from voting and jury service, uh, barriers to reentry. There are 40,000 barriers, 40,000 barriers or laws associated with formerly uh, incarcerated people as punishment, preventing them, that is, to uh, re-enter successfully back into society. Uh, formerly incarcerated people uh, have the permanent, permanent stigmatization as felons or convicts. They, many of them are uh, trauma, experience trauma. Uh, most people who were incarcerated during the war on drugs were nonviolent offenders. They go in nonviolent, but some come out violent because they're in a violent setting. There's increased poverty due to denial of employment and inability to contribute to family households. There is homelessness. Uh, in fact, according to a Prison Policy Institute uh, article, nowhere to go, homelessness among formerly incarcerated people formerly incarcerated people are 10 times more likely to be homeless than the general population. Why? Because they are not allowed uh, to access public housing or even in some cases, public benefits. And then the impact of incarceration, mass incarceration upon communities of color is that it has created a school to prison pipeline so that children 
already being criminalized and being prepared to go to prison. And then the impact of family destabilization. What are the solutions to ending racialization and mass incarceration? A complete overhaul of the criminal justice system from the point of arrest, prosecution, conviction, and sentencing. Uh, this means looking at DAs, uh, the police looking at DAs and even judges. Uh, another solution is the enactment of public policies that are redemptive, rehabilitative, and shifts away from retribution and punishment. Reduction of funding to overfunded law enforcement entities and reinvestment of those funds to rebuild communities most harmed by criminalization and incarceration. And then the creation of alternative means to ensure uh, public safety other than imprisonment, jail, and detention. For example, uh, more treatment centers, uh, more funding for mental health care, uh, more youth services and more youth centers, uh, more employment opportunities, and of course, no new prisons and no new jails. And then the last two, the last few would be the improved psychological screening and testing of peace officers to determine racial bias, the election of progressive DAs and judges who embrace new models for administering, administering justice and ensuring public safety. Then the removal of bar barriers to entry uh, and housing, uh, to access and housing, employment and public benefits. Then a complete restoration of rights of formerly incarcerated people, the right to vote, uh, the right to serve uh, uh, on a jury. Uh, and this uh, has yet to be done, even though we talked about it, the convening of national and local conversations on race and racism in schools, government, business, and corporate entities and religious institutions. 